And good morning. My name is Ryan Belmore. I'm the owner and publisher of What's Up Noob. And joining me is Mr. Frank Prosnitz. Frank, how are you? I'm fine. What politician do we have today? Oh, oh no, I'm oh, sorry. It's, That's funny. Funny. <laughs> it's funny. After doing 50 of these straight with local and statewide politicians, I just went to switch to our other graphic, non-political, mm -hmm. and... It's so far down, I couldn't find it. So uh, that's why we opened up with a blank graphic. Um, uh, they're, they're over. We've, we're behind it. And now uh, we can keep our conversations with interesting people going. Instead of conversations with the candidates, it's going to be conversations with interesting people. Yeah, actually, today we have two. Uh, we start off with uh, Michael Fine, who is former director of the Department of Health. Uh, uh, a very interesting guy who... Um, uh, deep down in his heart, he was always a writer. He's a novelist. He's a short story writer, also very much involved in healthcare. We'll talk about both of those. And um, later on today at 4.30, uh, we're going to find out how Seinfeld actually cooked. <laughs> when, That's it with uh, Mr. Brendan Kirby from the Roadshow right? uh, over on Fox Providence. will be joining us at 4.30 p.m. today. It's funny because normally I join him on air, but he'll be joining us on air. So uh, well, you may not know, but, but uh, Brendan and I worked together at the uh, Rhode Island Blood Center for a while. All right. I taught him Let's everything he out. knows. <laughs> That's it. And Dr. Michael Fine joins us. How are you, doctor? I'm great. It's really nice to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, um, as a doctor, you have patience. We went through the whole political process and had to have a lot of patience. So you had, <laughs> more kind. You had forbearance. <laughs> um, you know what I... I uh, First of all, people don't know Dr. Fine. He was the director of the Department of Health, very much now in, involved with uh, community health organizations, and we'll talk about that, but also short story writer, novelist. Um, recently, a uh, book of short stories came out, and then you have another book coming out, um, a medical book, I guess, in 2023. Correct. It's called On Medicine as Colonialism. Um, so, so why don't we just start there for a moment? And what does that mean? Um, that means that I have been wondering about the extent to which healthcare and medicine isn't really about making people better. I've been wondering about the extent to which medicine and healthcare really is about taking resources from the pockets of, you know, sort of regular people and putting those resources into the pockets of the rich. And it turns out when you analyze it, when I sat down to write the book, not only is that happening, but government has kind of been co-opted to, to facilitate that, that transfer of wealth. It's kind of an amazing thing because it's so different from what the way we think about healthcare and medicine altogether. You know, many years ago when I was involved with the Newspaper Guild, and I would talk with the uh, national, uh, the lawyer for the national or international. And uh, we would we would refer to inflation in the medical community as medflation because it always it always outpaced what the inflation was with everything else. Yeah, actually, it's about twice um, other inflation uh, in in normal times. So, you know, over 30 or 40 years, it's run something like four to five percent a year um, where the average of, of inflation, not this year, obviously, um, is about two, two and a half percent a year. So I'd like to stay on the, on the literature side for a moment and then we can come back to healthcare because I have a lot of questions there. But tell us about the late, your latest book. Well, on, on um, Rhode Island stories is not surprisingly stories all set in Rhode Island. Um, all set in many of our different communities. Um, you know, in Central Falls, in North Providence, in Providence, in Pawtucket, in East Greenwich, um, in South Kingston, uh, in Situate, not surprisingly, because I live here. Um, I haven't written a new one, a, a Newport one yet, but that's probably coming. Um, I'm actually working on one set in Warren. Um, but, it, you know, so the setting is important that it's it's sort of the settings are places that people know. Um, the streets and the stores and the experience that Rhode Islanders have, um, that's where these are all set. And they involve people from many different communities. Um, from, you know, I mean, not everybody realizes how many communities actually we have here living together. 
Um, and not any, not everybody kind of appreciates the inner life of people from those communities. So there are people from Liberia, people from Cape Verde, people from Guatemala, people from the Dominican Republic, people who are swamp Yankees from Situate, um, you know, like all over the place. And, you know, these are stories essentially about how they interact and, you know, what their experiences are like and what their rich inner lives are like. Um, and, and what these stories do is they kind of help us see ourselves as one people, because when you see the inner lives of people you don't actually know, you begin to understand that we're all pretty much darn alike. Having grown up in uh, Green, Rhode Island, um, and, and then living in Newport, uh, having lived in Providence, having lived in Newport, uh, I can certainly tell you that uh, people can certainly be different across this small state. Oh, there's incredible difference on the outside and incredible similarity on the inside. I know a bunch of people from Green, um, which for those, for those who may not know it, is in the far west of the state. Um, it's part of Exeter, right? Uh, uh, Coventry. 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 Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but but we, have, we, have, uh, we have, I think, hundreds of villages in Rhode Island, 39 yeah. cities and towns. Hundreds of villages. And, and, you know, we have a history that is too often forgotten. Nobody, often people don't remember that we were the richest state in the country 100 years ago. The richest state by far. Um, but we were also the state that had the biggest divide between rich and poor. Because there were lots of people who were living in those villages, which were mostly mill villages and working in the mills. And also lots of mill owners um, living you know, um, close by sometimes, sometimes in Providence or Newport. Um, but, you know, it made for a really interesting state and still makes for a really interesting state, you know, when you start to, to walk in and get to know these villages. Ken Payne, who was an aide to Claiborne Powell and then the legislature, uh, used to say that there were at least eight different economies in Rhode Island. And, yeah. And so I think that's reflected very much in what you're saying in terms of mill owners, the arts all scattered about the state in different areas and, and being really the, the backbone of uh, some regionalized economies. And, and not only is that the case, but I just want to give a shout out to Ken who got LIHEAP going, you know, the uh, process that helps low income people uh, get support for energy. Ken kind of did that himself. Very impressive stuff. Um, he's an interesting and very, very uh, impressive individual as well. Um, when you when you write these stories, are they based upon? And you do it. You do it short stories, like every couple of weeks or every month. How how frequently are you producing them? One short story a month. Um, I have a little website. If anybody wants to go onto the website and sign up, we'll send them to. We send them for free automatically. Mm -hmm. Now send them to about four thousand people a month. Are these stories based upon real incidents, real people? Or is it just geographically that, that that's what carries through in the stories? Well, based is always a hard word. Um, I mean, when I'm writing them, I hear the voices. I hear the voices of the characters clearly. And I think those voices are based on people I've met. But they're not those people. They're, they're a little different. Um, and they get, you know, that's the beauty of fiction. They kind of get transformed in my imagination. Um, and they end up doing things that I didn't expect um, and, you know, being different from any real person, but very much being based in a real person's voice. I work hard to hear the voices of people who I don't know that well or sometimes disagree, disagree with. I want to understand how everybody ticks. And so these stories are kind of my personal exploration of how people tick and what their inner voices really sound like. Dr. Fine, what is um, your website where people can sign up for the newsletter uh, for uh, to get stories sent to them? It's www.michaelfinemd.com. That was tough. That's pretty clever. <laughs> uh, I had to work hard on that one. <laughs> what do you want the reader to get out of your short stories? 
I, I understand what you get out of them. But what is the what do you want the reader to take away? That there is a place in our life for irrational hope. Um, that you know, by seeing the inner lives of other people, um, there's a way to uh, kind of connect emotionally. And if we can do that, we can really make democracy work because we give respect for those voices. And democracy and human life, all these things are incredibly unlikely and irrational. Um, only they happen. And so in a certain way, these stories are kind of a celebration of the beauty of that uh, realization of these completely irrational hopes, you know, which kind of are realized in a way that's miraculous every day. What got you into writing at what point in your life? You, you want to be you, like a good Jewish boy. You want to become a doctor. You, you no, it, probably... it, actually, it actually was the other, <laughs> other way. I started as a writer. Um, and I thought I was going to be a writer. And then I realized it was going to take me 10 or 15 years uh, before I could make a living at it. And it was in the early 70s. So I sort of thought that I had a moral obligation to kind of give back to society. So uh, I thought while I was waiting to, to, you know, sort of make a living as a writer, I'd go to medical school, make a living that way um, and give back a little bit as I was uh, trying to write. Of course, medicine turned out to be a fairly demanding mistress. And so the writing didn't happen with as much uh, I didn't have as much time to put into it as I wanted. Um, and so over the last 10 years, I've kind of seized that time back. Are, based on your, on your medical background, are many of your short stories um, health related? Mm, some, um, but not that many. Um, some, you know, sort of reference different diseases and conditions a little bit. You know, I'm working on a story about somebody who's uh, just coming out of the hospital after fracturing a hip um, and is kind of a hoarder. Uh, you know, there's a, a story that I think is quite beautiful about uh, a, a nurse who's a visiting nurse and the person she takes care of who's threatened with eviction. Um, you know, so they're informed by medicine. Um, but they're not really about medicine by and large. Um, maybe you can tell people well, you've written a novel um, and uh, uh, at least another one or two books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the novel is called Abundance. Um, it's set half in Rhode Island and half in Liberia at the end of the Liberian Civil War. It's two young Rhode Islanders go independently to Liberia, um, start a relationship and then get pulled apart by the war. One gets uh, captured by a warlord. The other is uh, brought back to the United States. And then when he, when he gets back to Rhode Island, put some people together to go back to Liberia to try to extricate the woman he left behind. A couple more books of short stories. There's one called The Bull, um, book of health policy called uh, uh, Healthcare Revolt, um, and another book of health policy uh, called the nature of health. So I kind of stay busy. And one and, more coming and up. In, one more. In one more on medicine is colonialism is coming. Uh, colonialism is coming out uh, in February, and then there's a novel called Redemption, which I hope will come out about a year later. That's Dr. It. Fine, I can't help but uh, just because it's been on Frank and I's brain for weeks and months now, uh, doing all of these political interviews. I just wonder with your professional background um, and your expertise, is there anything that you were watching carefully or anything that um, surprised you coming off of uh, the election? Is there anything that a doctor is watching differently than the rest of us? Um, well, I don't think that's a hard question. I, I, you know, I'm not sure I watch as a doctor. Um, I kind of watch more as an old community organizer. Um, what surprised me is that it went better than I thought. Um, than, and, and what surprised me is how much kind of strum and drum there is about, you know, how we were losing democracy and all that kind of stuff. And, and yet what I've always believed that 
our life and our culture depends on the decency of regular folks, um, that seemed to prove itself. That people showed up and, and you know, didn't get carried away. They, they kind of used their heads. Um, and we got some reasonable balance. And, and, you know, all these big, you know, these big crazies. The, you know, the election was stolen, that immigration is terrible by parenthetically. Immigration turns out to be really good for the country. You know, that the economy is abysmal. The economy is actually in decent sh shape, even though there's inflation. And all the kind of the sky is falling stuff didn't really seem to get people to exercise. People kind of kept their balance, used their heads, and were, you know, and provided us some, some, some guidance in, in a very nice way. Doesn't mean we don't have big challenges and, and, but we don't have to do a lot of hard work about talking to each other and learning to listen to the perspective of the other side. That's really important. And that's kind of what these stories are about, to try to help people understand the stories of people who they might disagree with. Um, we have a lot of work to do to listen and to talk and to stay away from, you know, social media and all that kind of craziness, which just seems to make craziness. Um, you know, but we, we are we are not lost and we are really, you know, the country of irrational hope at the end of the day. Interestingly, today, um, the latest inflation report has inflation uh, coming down. Um, it to, Which is uh, going to. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think it's 7.7 like percent, I think, was the number. Yeah. You know, it's going to come down. It's actually being well managed. And rather, you know, it's like it's going to come down. We'll go back to, you know, in, in a year or two, we'll go back to 2% inf inflation, you know, relatively low growth. You know, most of our growth turns out to be fired by immigration. You know, so like everybody's crazy about immigration, but immigration has been our strength. One day, maybe we'll start to see it that way. That's what feeds our job market. Feeds our job market. You know, m most people don't know that the United States has the fourth highest birth rate in the world. Which, which also propels us. And almost all that birth rate is from immigra immigrants. You know, it, it, you know our, our ability to be, you know, this quilt that brings people in and integrates them and gives them a common life hasn't really been affected yet. And hopefully we'll continue to be that amazing place that, that you know, sort of brings in the hungry, the tired and the poor and gives us a collective life out of that. I couldn't help but think um, it had to have been a little bit difficult two years ago uh, when we were going through the election campaign where everybody had to have an opinion on medical, uh, on COVID or pandemics. Everybody had to pick a side and know everything and uh, be an expert in it. And here we are with the experts. Yeah. And, and, and Ryan, you know, one of the things that was scary to me, it's all the, you know, all the craziness, all the myths and the stories, you know, there's some evidence that most of them were coming from Russian trolls. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we have a weak point, it's that we let other people come in and sort of distort our, our thinking. You know, this wasn't hard. And yet we let ourselves get split apart. And in the splitting apart, you know, we lost 900,000 people we didn't need to lose, you know, because we just couldn't agree on simple stuff. And that's why getting to where we agree on simple stuff is so important. Public health isn't hard. We just need to stop fighting about it. So I, I wanted to I wanted to take a look at um, our health system in Rhode Island. Um, we've had a, a failed merger between Lifespan and Care New England. We've had the CEOs of both of those organizations are um, are resigning, are not retiring. They're resigning, I think. Um, we have a revolving door when it comes to the Department of Health, the director of the Department of Health. We have shortages among um, uh, many medical professions, uh, principally uh, nurses. We've had, um, <clears throat> I just heard from uh, uh, at, at, at one of the hospitals, where they, um, they're even taking real shortcuts of, of where they throw certain uh, 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 materials, old, old needles and whatever, 
now they, they're they're doing they're less cautious about where they go to try and save a little bit on on the other end. Uh, it sounds like um, our system is in need of of something. I'm not sure what it is. It's in need of leadership. I mean, first of all, we don't have a system. All we have is a market. Um, we have abandoned our sense of co- of the common good to the market, and this is what the market has done. And it's going to get worse. Um, people who know health policy are predicting that hospitals are going to lose 20% of their volume in the next few months. And when that happens, uh, we're going to see large numbers of hospital bankruptcies across the United States, probably a couple in Rhode Island. And we're totally unprepared for that. I mean, you know, this is, we could fix this. Rhode Island is the place where everybody knows we could make this work. You know, we need we needed that merger to happen. There was a way to make it happen. Um, we need Brown to take 50 percent of its medical school class from Rhode Island instead of six or 10 percent. We need to double or triple the number of of medical students. And then we need to triple the number of nursing students. You know, this stuff isn't actually hard. What seems to be hard is leadership and consensus and not letting ourselves get picked apart by people with something to sell which we do over and over again and expect a different result somehow, it ain't going to happen. It takes focus and leadership, political leadership, um, but also courage um, to be able to say something that's difficult and unpopular and work hard to get it done so that we make a healthcare system that is for people, not for profit, and takes care of every single Rhode Islander. It is a doable thing. We've, we've, we've suggested ways of doing it that would cut the cost like in half. It's not that hard. There's lots of data. We just have to do it. it is an answer, or at least part of the answer, <clears throat> concentrating more on some of these community health centers like, um, like uh, Wood River Health and Thunder Mist and, and the one you're involved with and, and all of these taking some of the pressures off of the hospitals in fact, and, and, and providing an alternative for people, who uh, some of them who use the emergency room as their, as their everyday doctor rather than going to some kind of a, a community health organization. That's the way to do this. I mean, we need to build something that looks like a community health center. Some of them might be private, but, you know, do different ways. But one, one for every community of 10,000 people um, and keep it open from eight o'clock in the morning till eight at night and open on weekends. Um, and be places where people have a personal physician who knows them and knows their family and community. If if you want to look at one, look at Bristol County Medical Center, um, which is private um, in Bristol. They do a great job. Almost every service you can imagine is available in Bristol. They've got a, a, a walk-in or, or urgent care that's open most of the time. If And they've got great doctors. I mean, I mean, you know, this they can do it in Bristol. You know, we've done something like it in Central Falls. You know, Providence has done something like it with the Providence Community Health Centers. You know, we have the right idea. All we need is 50 more of them. And we need to have a focused attention to workforce. So we have the nurses and the doctors we need to work there, you know, so that we're training primary care doctors and, you know, taking our students from Rhode Island, from Providence and from uh, Cranston and Situate and Central Falls, taking them into medical school, getting them to be family doctors and pediatricians and internists, instead of training kids from California and New Jersey to be ophthalmologists and neuropathologists who are going to move to wherever. You know, Bob Arcioli, who was at Roger Williams Medical Center uh, years ago, <clears throat> once told me that his um, he had this concept where each of our hospitals would have a specialty. We would have a, uh, a cancer hospital. We would have a geriatric hospital. We would have a cardiac hospital. Um, they still have their emergency rooms and whatever, but, but his feeling at that point is by having those specialties concentrated in, in one area that you would have the potential to attract some of the best docs into that, into that hospital. Does that make any sense? Not to me, to be honest. Um, if we built a, public primary care system where everybody has a community clinic to go to, we would cut the need for hospital beds in half, um, in half, um, because hospitals represent 30 to 40% of our healthcare expenditure. It would save us a whole lot of money. 
And then and we could coordinate, we could put all those services in one place. Put having them in one place gives you critical mass that you need. You know, who needs seven ICUs in a state this small? Um, who needs seven trauma centers in a state this small? We need enough volume going of, of enough volume of real uh, urgent situations going to one place. And that gives you the critical need, the critical mass you need to make sure there are the best anesthesiologists who are available all the time, ready to go. You know, the, the, the best specialists in one place, um, because this is, you know, all these services are overlapping. At the end of the day, one of the great resources that nobody remembers in Rhode Island is the tunnel that connects women and infants to Rhode Island Hospital, because there are women who are pregnant um, who get into trouble and need the ICU at Rhode Island. And there are women at Rhode Island who have gynecologic issues that are urgent, who need uh, help from women and infants. These collaborations are important and critical collaborations. We could build them and build them strong if we had courage, focus, and discipline. But we don't. And of course, they add to that Hasbro Children's Hospital on the same campus. And you've really covered much of uh, much of the needs. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we, you know, I'm not sure we really need more than one hospital. If we had, you know, one really big, excellent hospital, if we had lots of, uh, you know, lots of uh, health centers, you know, I mean, I think we probably need Newport Hospital um, because Newport is, you know, across the way, and and so on and so forth. And we may need Landmark, and we may need South County kind of as, as smaller uh, stations on the way. But the rest, you know, I think are probably access to need and end up costing. That's why we spend so much on healthcare because we haven't thought about how, how to run this as a system instead of a market um, and run it efficiently in the interest of the public's health instead of in the interest of profit for individuals. I don't know uh, where Frank was going to go with this, but I'll ask and see if I can get myself in trouble. Uh, do you ever get the opportunity, Dr. Fine, to consult or share these uh, opinions with um, current leadership or the Department of Health? Um, well, you know, I'm going to I'm going to answer sort of the political. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let us say that I make my feelings known. Um, and I make my feelings known, I think, with uh, with some regularity. You know, I'm not convinced that anybody wants them. You know, in the pandemic, we wanted business open instead of saving lives. It cost us 500 lives because we didn't mask a year ago when we could have. That kind of thing. And then this health policy stuff. You know, I know a bunch of state legislators. And every time I can get in a room with one, I bend their ear and I think... I'm boring, but, you know, it's worth a shot. Remember, I'm the guy who believes in irrational hope, and I still have it. Actually, Ryan, I was going to go in a similar direction, but but before I go in that direction, I have, I have a question about public versus, versus private. We've had, we've had a lot of out-of-state organizations that have come in and have bought our hospitals, Yale New Haven, uh, Westerly, and you go around the state, and we have all of these out-of-state entities, many of them uh, for profit, that have come into the state. Is that a bad thing? You know, I mean, it, it kind of it depends. Uh, when you look at not-for-profit hospitals, they run just like for-profit hospitals. We call them. I, well, see, I, I never know, think they, there's, they, there's when I I've taken a look at the the uh, lifespan and at the salaries of their top people. They're not. They're all for profit. Somebody's making money That's out kind of, of those institutions. That's kind of what I mean. We call them, you know, in health policy, we call them not tax paying, not not for profit, because the money comes out instead of as profit, the money comes out as salaries. Um, you know, so uh, I'm not sure that distinction really matters. What matters is that their boards are unaccountable to anybody. They're self-appointed boards. They're, you know. I mean, if we wanted to fix, you know, issues of disparities in race, first thing we ought to do is make, you know, significant portions of hospital boards people of color. It's not hard. 
Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of things that we could do that's not hard. The for-profit, not-for-profit distinction doesn't matter. Um, I think there needs to be way more public participation. So I think hospital boards, if we're going to keep having them, you know, should probably be elected or something similar to that. So they're accountable to the people they pay that, that are paying the bill. What also nobody knows is that 70% of hospital revenue is from public sources. We are giving 70% of the money they collect is from Medicare and Medicaid. So they're publicly funded with zero public accountability. What kind of sense does that make? If you had a one message to give to the governor and to the state legislature as they now begin new terms um, in terms of where they need to concentrate on health care, what would that message be? It's the delivery system, which means in order to make this work, you got to think about what services are available in what communities to whom, not how you pay for it. First, you fix the delivery system, and part of that is fixing workforce, and then you can start to get at how much it costs. But if you try to go cost first, you're going to get you're going to get beat up every time by people with something to sell. Excellent. So, One know, more remember, time. Oh, good. Oh, Bill Clinton used to say, "It's the economy in healthcare. It's the delivery system." Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Well, hopefully Dr. somebody's. Have we, missed uh, anything that, have we missed anything that you'd like to mention this morning? Oh, I think we covered it all. You guys were great. Thank you. Well, oh, thank you. And Ryan, you were going to say the uh, website again? Yeah, I was just going to throw it out there: michaelfinemd.com, and uh, you could sign up for. Um, well, you can read more about uh, the books and the short stories uh, that Dr. Fine has done, as well as sign up for his newsletter. Um, and uh, get them, some of them delivered right to you. Can't I guess that. I have one, one other quick question. Where can they find your books? Um, in most bookstores in Rhode Island. You know, they're on Amazon and all that kind of stuff, but uh, most bookstores happen. They're even available at the Amtrak train station in Providence. <laughs> um, it's actually great fun for me to see them. Um, they do a great job with them there, as they do in many other places. Um, there's that a latest you know, one. There are a couple of great stores in Newport, um, and they're there, et cetera. Latest book, Excellent. Rhode Island Stories, and a medical book coming up in a few months. Michael, thank you much. Appreciate you coming thank on this you. morning. Thank you very much for having me, Ryan. Good to see you again. All right. Nice to see you, Dr. Fine. That is Dr. Michael Fine, and we appreciate him joining us today. One more time, michaelfinemd.com. You can find out more about uh, everything that he has going on. Um, certainly uh, keeping busy and uh, lots of uh, great stuff coming out um, with his writing in his books. And his, uh, and his uh, medical stuff. He's very much involved in the community uh, and uh, is, a gr is a great voice. And it's, um, it's great to have him on. He's, uh, uh, he he's a terrific guest and it's, it's fun, to, uh, fun to talk about his books, but also... Um, really important to talk about the healthcare issues. That's it. All right, Mr. Prozitz, appreciate you uh, joining us this morning. And uh, um, we will you know, do I'm gonna, this again. I'm going to dig out my chef's hat for 430. I'll see what I can come up with in just a couple hours here. <laughs> thank you. All right. On behalf of Frank Prozitz, all of us here at What's Up Noop, we want to thank Dr. Michael Fine for joining us today, for taking the time to join us. MichaelFineMD.com to learn more about his books. Have a uh, somebody in mind that you would like to see us interview, uh, either you would like to learn more about, an author, uh, anybody in the community, anybody across Rhode Island in the region, let us know. Ryan at whatsupnoop.com. Thanks for watching.